Coming to you with words and teaching that will change your life forever. All things that you will ever need in your life, they're wrapped up in the Word. Go for the Word. You need to understand these things. And when you get a hold of it, keep saying it. Don't stop talking it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. The Bible says in the city of Ephesus, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Can you shout amen? I said on the cross that I must follow. In the name of Jesus, prosperity is mine. In the name of Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Pastor Chris, word hearing. Getting excited about Jesus? Yes. You sure? Yes. The Bible says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. That means get excited about Him. See, people who are always excited about God always have supernatural things happening in their lives they always have a glorious life then you have those who are dull they love God but they're dull they don't delight themselves in him so everything that happens in their lives is also dull he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you. You won't need to pray and ask for anything. Your prayer will be prayers of worship and intercession for other people. You will never have to be asking for anything for yourself. But whenever God sees that in your heart you desire anything, before you ask, he'll give it. That's what the Bible says. He says, delight yourself in in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart he didn't say when you pray hallelujah are you ready for something yes. all right let's quickly look at a few things we're talking about The fight of faith, right? It says, fight the good fight of faith. And I told you what the fight of faith is. Now, I, I think in the second service, I didn't get to ask me to write this thing down, but you write it down. Our faith life is... Living in the reality of the words, the word, the word of God, of the words, declarations about us. Living in the reality of the words, declarations about us. It is living the life of the heavenly city now. It is seeing, hearing, 
and talking the language of the beloved country. Our beautiful life of the beloved country. I come from the city of the living God. You know it, don't you? Are you from there? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I want us to look at some things. We're talking about the fight of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Just because a man seems successful doesn't mean he will always be successful. Bad things happen to good people. The question is why? A lot of bad things happen to good people. And they say, why? Why, why should bad things happen to good people? Because good people think that just because they are good, everything should be all right. But this is a bad world. <laughs> So, you see, faithful Christians particularly have a lot of problems. Faithful Christians, good Christians, they face a lot of problems and they wonder why. Because they have refused, many of them, not all of them, many of them have refused to acknowledge the fact that they are engaged in a warfare. They say, Jesus has done it for me. Yes. He has done it for you, but he told you to fight the fight of faith. He didn't say fight the devil. We are not fighting the devil. He has been defeated. He said fight the good fight. He calls it a good fight. A good fight. The good fight of faith. Now just in case you didn't um, get involved in the teaching when we started several weeks ago, the opening scriptures, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. And then you have another one, and uh, that's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. Where Paul said, I have fought a good fight. You see, he said, I have fought a good fight. He fought a good fight. And he wrote to Timothy and said, fight the good fight of faith. He told us in 2 Corinthians 10 chapter, when we read from the third verse, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? Somebody says, Satan has built a lot of strongholds in that place. What do you mean by strongholds? The teaching of the scripture regarding strongholds has to do with ideas, thoughts, Principles, theories of this world that have been established or constructed against the declarations of God's word about us. And sometimes they have been such ideas that have created a mindset in certain people or in certain societies. That's what they call strongholds. But then the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not man-made. They are not of human understanding. He says they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. That means through the Holy Ghost. I told you how to know in Scripture when he uses the word God or when he refers to, when he gives us the word God, Spirit, how can we tell whether he's referring to the Father or to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus? Now, when he says the word, it's simple for us to know he's either talking about the Scriptures or the living word, Jesus Christ. And then when he talks about the Spirit, that's simple for us, the Holy Spirit. But then when he uses a generic term, God, does that particular word 
apply to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit? We can tell by the context. And I explained to you how you can tell. Now this one, for example, it says, they're mighty through God. It's not through the Father. Why? Because he's dealing with something that we ought to operate in the earth. So he's not talking about through God the Father or through God the Son, Jesus. He means through the Holy Spirit, meaning that we are in charge of such operation because the Holy Spirit is no longer in heaven. He's here in the earth. He says they are mighty through the Holy Spirit. So, and I remember sharing with you one time, teaching you on um, uh, the, the Spirit of God ministering through us and we ministering through the Spirit. You remember that? They are mighty through God, through the Holy Spirit. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Imaginations. Sometimes there are imaginations that are against the word of God in our lives. He says we can use the word of God to tear them down. Sometimes you are haunted by imaginations, terrible imaginations. Here it is, you want to travel, you keep seeing yourself in an accident. Every time you close your eyes, you see yourself in an accident. You wake up in the hospital, oh God, oh God, oh God. He says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through the Holy Ghost. To cast down imaginations. Then it says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And to bring into captivity. That means to arrest, hallelujah, every thought and make it subject to Christ. Hey. Oh, 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 glory to God. What a life. Look, you ought, to be, you ought to be victorious every day. You should be on top every day. Have an exciting life every day. I, I don't know any other life. I live an exciting life every day. Every day. Every day. I have no sometimes down, sometimes up. I don't have anything like that. I don't know depression. I don't know how to sit down worrying. I don't worry. I can't worry. You say, why? Because the word, look, I have imbibed the word. Do you understand? He told me to have no anxiety about anything. But that in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, I should make my request known to God. And that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall garrison my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So I don't know how to worry. I don't know enough to worry. You know, some people worry so much. So you, you see some little kids worrying. You start wondering. Ah, ah. Little children, some of them worry. Where they get it from? From their parents. A chip off the old block. A little girl worrying, a little boy worrying. They look older than they really are. Because daddy always worries. Mommy always worries. So they too, they, they feel unnatural if they don't worry. Everybody comes to the house worrying. <laughs> Say this with me, I refuse to worry. I refuse to worry. Mary says, count it all joy when you go through diverse tests. Count it all joy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God, through the Holy Ghost, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, bringing down everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, and arresting every thought, subjecting it to Christ. What weapons? The weapons of our warfare. I want to show you one of those weapons. 
Because we're talking about fighting the good fight of faith. One of those weapons. Hallelujah. You know what we were sharing the other day? We, we talked about uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the what? The rhema of God. It is the word of God, but not just the word of God, but the rhema, meaning the spoken word. It is the now word. It's what is God saying right now about my situation. Well, maybe I don't know. If I don't know, what do I do? I pray. I stay up my spirit in the Holy Ghost until I receive rhema, which is the now word. The now word is what God is saying right now concerning me, concerning my situation. So he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. You know, people carry a small Bible and say, uh, this, is, this is not a sword, this is a dagger. <laughs> they carry a big Bible and say, this is my sword. So the sword is a big Bible. The small Bible is only a dagger. <laughs> Nepio's revelation. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's talking about the logos of God. But you see here, he says, take the sword of the Spirit. Where? In your mouth. The sword of the Spirit. I told you all that kind of prayer people pray and they say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I give it to you. In Jesus' name. It's not in your hand. The sword is in your mouth. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about Jesus. It says, and from his mouth was what? A sword. Not hand. Because it is the rhema of God. It is the word of God. Hallelujah. And you remember another thing we talked about? The shield of faith. He says, above all. Because he told us about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, our loins got about with truth, the, our feet shut with the preparation of the gospel of uh, peace. Then he says, above all. Taking what? The shield of faith. He says, with which ye shall be Able to quench. Ah. Ah. He says the shield of faith with which you shall be able. God knows better than us. He told us, he says, with your shield of faith, you shall be able. He didn't say you will pray and I will help you. He said you, you will have the ability, the inherent ability. To quench, to put out, to neutralize all the fiery, he didn't say some, he says all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He says above all, take the shield of faith. And there are people who write books against us and criticize us for the message of faith. They say all those people, they call them, they call us. Name it and claim it bunch. Ha! Ah, glory to God. They don't know it's a blessing. They call us name it and claim it bunch. You know what that means? They say we, we think that if we just name it and claim it, it's ours. But that's exactly what the Bible says. So they laugh at us like that. But while they're laughing, they're drowning. And they're laughing us to the top. <laughs> Why they're calling us name it and claim it bunch, they're suffering. And they don't know how bad their case is. And yet the Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith with which ye shall be able. Oh. Oh, he has given me ability. He has given me ability. No wonder Paul said, our sufficiency, our ability, our, he can notice. Our ability, our competence. is the ability of God. It's working in us. That's what he said. 
Hallelujah. That's the only way you can count it all joy when you go through diverse tests. That's the only way. When your ability is the ability of God, you're not trusting in your strengths, but you're not asking for the strength either. You see, you don't trust in your, in your ability, but you are not praying to God to give you ability. Why? Because his ability has supplanted your ability. These are not things we're trying to get for ourselves. They're the things already written about us. Hallelujah. Okay, let me show you some. First Timothy. Ha <laughs> ha, glory to God. Woo-hoo. Ah. Mm. Hey. Ha ha ha. Mm. First Timothy chapter 1, and I want to read to you in verse 18. Hmm. Ah, ah. <laughs> now, Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them, by the prophecies, mightest war a good warfare. Hmm. Let me read it to you from the Good News Bible. The Good News Bible. It says, Timothy, my, my child, I entrust to you this command, which is in accordance with the words of prophecy spoken in the past about you. Use those words as weapons in order to fight well. He says, use those words, those words of prophecy. He says, use them as weapons in order to fight well. He says, the prophecy is spoken concerning you. Do you know anything that has been said about you? You remember what I shared with you the other day? What was it here? Huh, I'm, I'm wondering now, was it here or was it at Abuja? I was sharing something. And uh, I remember what I was talking about uh, the, the temptation of Jesus. When Jesus said, the first time, uh, uh, um, Satan said to him, if thou be the Son of God, um, command these stones made, to be made bread. And Jesus said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then he took Jesus, the Bible says, to the mountain, a high mountain, and showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then he took him to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, and said to him, if thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down. Satan was talking to Jesus. Cast yourself down, for it is written. Satan, Satan noticed how Jesus quoted the logos. First time he said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. You know, Jesus. The second time he said, it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. So Satan now said, ooh. So this is the Bible game. So he said, if thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. (laughs) He shall give his angels charge over thee, and they shall keep thee, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Ooh. So what did Jesus do? Jesus stopped 
quoting Logos and gave him Rhema. Jesus said, it is said. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the Bible says, Satan departed from him. As long as you are quoting logos, Satan can play the game with you until you take your sword of the spirit, which is the rhema. Oh, hallelujah. Rhema. That is what God has said about you. It is written. Didn't put him off. It is written until Satan joined and said, It is also written. <laughs> so that's why he told us that we should take what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Rhema, the spoken word for the now. Hallelujah. So just because the Bible said something about you doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy it. The only way you're going to enjoy it is where you take it from it is written to what is said about you. It must become personal. Rhema is the personal word. It's the now word. It is the active word for you. For the now. That's why he said, by them, says, remember those prophecies spoken about you. Those prophecies were written about Timothy. They were spoken about Timothy. They were not for everybody. Sometimes God speaks to you in prophecy and he says, lo, I am with you. That is different from it is written, lo, I am with you. Because right now it is rhema. It is coming from the spirit now. It is the now word for you right now. So I am with you. No matter how small that prophecy is, it is powerful. I am with you. God is with me. That, that moment, that is the word for you. It is a personal word to you. God has said, I am with you. Therefore, no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. So you take that. He says that by them thou mightest war a good warfare. We read it in Good News Bible. It says use them as weapons so that you will fight well. So whether you know it or not, you are in a fight. In the realm of the spirit, you are in a fight. You are either fighting well or losing in the fight. The fight of faith. I don't understand. My faith is weak. I just wish somebody would just do something about it. I just wish somebody, I hope somebody is praying for me somewhere. I just believe that God has a way of doing these things. Somebody that doesn't know you just pray for you. For somewhere. <laughs> you are deceiving yourself. I don't know. I just believe somebody is praying for me. Someone must be praying for me somewhere. Because if not, if not God, if not God, better wake up and fight the good fight. <laughs> Fight. Bible didn't say pray that somebody will be fighting the good fight for you. Fight the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. Are you in the fight? Yes. Well, you already conscripted for it, whether or not you like it. It's a good fight. Didn't you read it? Fight the good fight. It's a good fight. We all ought to be involved in it. It's a good fight. Hallelujah. You ready for the next one? Okay. Turn to the book of James. James chapter 1. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, we used to sing one song those years. I still love the song, but you see, it's got to have meaning with it. it says, 
Hallelujah, I have Lord Jesus in my heart. Hallelujah, my heart is full of joy. Hallelujah, I have Lord Jesus in my heart. Hallelujah, my heart is full of joy. Some even have another version. Hallelujah, I have Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. Hallelujah, my heart is full of joy. <laughs> but you see, that Jesus is in your heart doesn't mean your heart will be full of joy. And that Jesus, in real sense, spiritual sense, Jesus is not in your heart. Jesus is in heaven. The only way Jesus could be in your heart is if his word is in your heart. So you see them crying and sad. They're not happy. I am Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. Hallelujah. My heart is full of joy. I'm happy. Hallelujah. But you can truly be happy. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, James chapter 1. I want to read to you verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and breedleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Kai. The next verse says, pure religion. He didn't say successful. He says, pure religion and undefiled. Is visiting the fatherless and the widow and what? Assisting them and helping them in their affliction. Now, I want you to know this because the, uh, the 27th verse is not an answer to the 26th verse. I want you to know this. He didn't say, but. Pure religion. He's telling you what pure religion is. What is he doing? James was a pastor. He, gave, he tried to give a balance. What he was doing there was giving a balance. He says, if any man among you seem to be religious and does not control his tongue, but deceives his own heart, his own spirit, he deceives his spirit. And I'll explain that to you. That's so profound. He says, that man's religion is vain, is worthless. Now, just in case you have the right religion working and it's successful, he says, but there's such a thing as pure religion. He says, let your religion be pure. Which means your faith life, he's trying to say, your faith life should be full of purity too. Faith and righteousness, that's what he's saying. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. You get it? All right, so now let's explain verse 26. He says, if any man among you seem to be religious and doesn't control his tongue, but deceives his spirit, what is James telling us? How can you deceive your spirit? He says, to deceive your heart. He says, the man seems to be religious, but doesn't control his tongue. Have you seen somebody that seems religious? Bro, good morning, bro. <laughs> he, he, he's, he's stainless steel. You understand what I mean? <laughs> good morning, brother. <laughs> In fact, Hadley would dress like this. Good morning, brother. Good morning, brother. Sis, how are you? The Lord is wonderful. <laughs> he seems to be religious. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, Jesus. He seems religious. Good morning, brother. No, no, no. He seems religious. He 
seems to lead us. The Bible says, if any man among you seems religious, without controlling his tongue, he says, that man's religion is vain. He says, the man deceives his own heart. He says, without controlling your tongue, but deceive your heart. How do you deceive your heart? How do you deceive your spirit? How can a man deceive his heart? Now, that's different from the colloquial communication when they say, uh, you are just deceiving yourself. That's not the point. No, 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 uh, that's not what James is saying. James is speaking spiritually. To deceive your spirit. Oh, Kavali. To deceive your spirit means to make your spirit believe a lie. Ah, I'm, I'm not a rich man. I'm a poor man, poor man like me. Keep on. Oh, Aya, do you understand what? The more you say such things, listen, as you say them, they go into your spirit. They go into your spirit. They go into your spirit. The Bible says the kingdom of God is as if a man, it's in Mark's gospel chapter 4, when you read from the 26th verse, it says, it's as if a man took seed and sowed them in the ground. And the man went and slept night and day. He says, and that thing sprouted, grew up, and produced. He says, and the man didn't know how. All he had to do was to sow it. He says, so is the kingdom of God. And the Bible says, the sower sows the word. So what you are sowing is the thing you are saying. And the Bible says the heart of man is the ground that receives the seed. See, I don't know what is happening in our family, just sickness everywhere. Keep on talking like that. We are talking about the fight of faith. And here you are, you know, talking like a, like a mouse. You, you, you think like you can, you can say what you like and get away with it. You are joking. You are deceiving your heart, deceiving your spirit, making your spirit believe a lie. Listen, even if you were made the, the chairman of the federal government, And central bank was given to you free that you should spend as you like. You will still become poor if you talk poverty. How? Let me show you from the Bible. You ready to see something? First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read to you from verse 9. You ready? But as it is written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. He says, God has prepared great things, wonderful things, beyond human imagination for those who love him. Okay? But, look at verse 20, uh, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God has revealed those things which God has prepared for them that love Him. He has revealed them. Watch this. But God had revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit searches all things. The Spirit searches the deep things of God. Like a scanner. You know what? The Spirit searches is scanning through all the deep things of God, all the important, serious things, the profoundest things of the spirit realm. He says the spirit searches. That's scanning. You know how to use a scanner. Like, okay, most all of you can identify with a with a with a mobile phone. And you turn on your mobile phone and you're searching for signals. Alright? Scanning for signals. 
So the Spirit of God, he says, searches the deep things of God. Watch. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Ah, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Look, you know what, what he's telling you? He says the Holy Spirit which is the Spirit of God, searches the deep things of God. He scans through the divine things. He's the only one that knows the things of God. He says, no man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. He says, in the same way, no man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man that is in him. So what does the Spirit do? He's telling us that the function of the human spirit is like the function of the Holy Ghost. So, your spirit scans through you. What is it looking for? The things you have said, so that your spirit will produce them for you. Are you hearing me? So, the Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart, what is happening? It's scanning through, scanning through, and arranging the things you have said. The things you have said. And then he starts producing them for you. The Bible says a man's spirit divides it, fabricates his way. You didn't, you didn't catch that? He says it's a man's spirit that devises his way. The way you're going to go. Your journey in life. He says it's your spirit that's going to fabricate it. It's going to arrange it. Then it says, but God directs the steps. But he doesn't do it automatically. Now, what I just quoted for you is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Now, he doesn't do that automatically, the second part of that verse. Directing your steps. How? Because in Proverbs chapter 3, when you read verse 6, he tells us that we should not lean onto our own understanding. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. If you acknowledge him in all your ways. But before he will direct your steps, your spirit will fabricate, will devise your way, the way you're going to go. Then the Holy Spirit will guide you into that way. But if you deceive your own spirit, he says your religion is vain. And then if you study, we, we, we studied the words of Paul the other day in uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, when, when he wrote to him. And we noticed something. When we're talking about three kinds of knowledge. You remember? It says, them that are taken captive at the devil's will. There are people who are taken captive at the devil's will. Anytime he can just do what he likes in their lives. Satan controls them. Whatever he wants in their lives, if he wants them for the next one week to be full of sickness, that's it. The Bible talks about the evil day when Satan shows up. So because he's busy, he can't be everywhere at the same time. His demons cannot be everywhere at the same time. So when he has recess from a particular person, he goes somewhere else. He will come back later. Like the Bible says, he departed from Jesus for a season. But the next time he came, Jesus was ready too. What does the Bible say? It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the evil day, because that evil day will come. That evil day is when the evil one shows up at your door and strikes, crash. You say, oh, what is it? They tell you, you were born with something, something, something. You are now 39 years old. This thing they said you were born with has not worried you until now. What are you going to do? The evil day has caught you unprepared. From then on till you are 65, 
this sickness has now taken over your life. Now you are 65. They said the thing started when you were 39. But you were born with it. Say, I refuse. That's no way to end. That's just the introduction. When you say, I refuse, you must do something more. You can't just say, Satan, I refuse, I refuse, I refuse, I refuse. Refuse what? <laughs> you say, I refuse to be sick. I refuse to be sick. Why? Can I tell you something? Why some of you are talking, some others are looking at them like that. <laughs> what are they saying? They're not, they're not getting the stuff yet. Listen, some of you eat different times in the day. You know, you eat in the morning because you say um, that uh, you must eat. Because <laughs> Jesus didn't say man shall not live by bread at all. All right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> shall not live by bread alone. So you eat. Hmm? In the afternoon, you eat again. Some in the evening, you eat again. You just eat, eat. You say you are eating to keep your body alive. Okay. Let me tell you. It is more important that you feed on the Word of God. How do you feed on the Word of God? When you study the Word and meditate on the Word, what is meditation? There are three levels of meditation. The first level of meditation, and you ought to have the three of them, the two important. The first level of meditation is when you quietly ponder over what you have studied or what you're reading or the Word of God that has inspired you. You are quietly pondering over it, thinking through it, all right? That's meditation. You just silently set your mind on it, think through it, you let it fill your thoughts for the moment. The second level of meditation is when you begin to mutter. The first one is like you're musing over it. The second one is like you're muttering. So now you're talking it under your voice. You just see you're talking, but nobody's hearing you. At the second level of meditation, your lips are moving. You're using your lips. So you talk, but you're not disturbing anybody, you're just talking under your voice. Then there is the third level of meditation. The third level of meditation is when you are talking out loud for the purpose of drowning other thoughts in your consciousness. This time, what you're trying to do is letting those words, those thoughts, those things you've meditated upon that you've taken into your spirit, you're letting them overrule your mind. So now you're going to talk out loud. And I suggest that when you want to do that, you shut your doors. Keep everybody else out. Or get in your car. I remember when I was much younger, I will get in the car because there was no other place that was, that was uh, uh, convenient. I'll get in, into my dad's car. In fact, I remember one day my uncle beat me in the night because he saw me in the car. He said I wanted to drive out. I said, I don't want to drive out. But he, just, he was just angry with me. The gates were locked. I said, I didn't even, I, I said, I, I was sitting at the back seat. He saw me and he still beat me. <laughs> How could I drive the car from the back seat? But see, that was, you know, Satan's way of trying to attack me at the time. There was no place to pray. Sometimes I needed to pray out loud. 
See, sometimes you need to talk loud. And you can't blame other people for feeling disturbed by your prayer. So you got to look for somewhere where you, you can shout the way you want. So I'll get in the car like that and, and roll the glasses up and shout and pray and shout, 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 shout my mind down and talk my spirit up. <laughs> this was years ago. It's important. Sometimes you don't know where to go. Go into the bathroom, the toilet. Stay in there and be talking. Because that's the only place somebody will say, oh, sorry, they won't call you out. <laughs> Everywhere else they may call you. So sometimes, you know, I used to do that. I'd get in the, in the bathroom or in the toilet and shut the door. And they're looking for me. Oh, the door is like this. I'm talking, talking, talking. You know what I was doing? I was arranging my future. <laughs> That's what I was doing. That's what I was doing. When I was 14 years old, 15 years old, you know. Hallelujah. So I, I've done that through the years. I've learned how to get a quiet place. See, these three levels of meditation are so important. Look, if you keep doing how you've been doing and you're expecting a different result from the result you've been getting you're deceiving yourself because you're not going to get a different result in fact that's one of the definitions of madness doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result that's not going to work you're going to have to change things See, sometimes you have some people that, okay, oh, he's taken up with diabetes or he's taken up with some kind of terrible, maybe lupus, something, some terrible disease. And so he says, I don't know where I got it from. How did you get it? I'll tell you how you got it. You got it from the kind of life you've been living since. It finally caught up with you. Now look at this. When God said to Adam, the day you eat of this tree, of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, you shall surely die. It took 930 years for Adam to finally die. Almost a thousand years. 930 years. Before it finally got him. So just because nothing happened since. Look, it's been working against you. Now, when you receive healing, if you continue the way you were doing before, it will attack you, in fact, more easily and more viciously. So the word of God must be in your mouth. That's the life you live now. See, the Bible tells us the blood of the human person, the blood of your body, is the life of your body. But after you're born again, the life of your body is no longer from the blood running through your body. Look, a Christian is not an ordinary person. Every human being has his life, the physical life of his body coming from his blood. But when you're born again, it's no longer your blood that gives you life. The Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also give life to your mortal body. So it's the spirit of God that has taken over. Why? You remember when Jesus died, his blood gushed out completely. The Bible says a Roman soldier thrust the spear through his side and his, his heart ruptured. Okay? So his, the, 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 all the blood drained out. And in the realm of the spirit, we are told that that was the sacrifice for our sins. That his blood was presented to God. So he was buried without blood in his body because the heart ruptured. And so all the blood went out. All the blood in his body ran out. His body was buried without blood. So it's not like maybe the blood coagulated. No, it all drained out. His blood completely drained out. Then he was buried. 
When God raised him from the dead, the Bible says he was raised to life by the Spirit and lives by the Spirit. Now, that life that he lives by the Spirit is what has been granted us. Amen. Hallelujah. So if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation that lives by the Spirit. That's the reason he said, if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That means they cannot be poisoned. Because you see, when you're, when you're, when you're poisoned, it goes through your blood system. But now because you don't live by the blood system, it's impossible for you to be poisoned. That's why you have to know it. See, these things function through knowledge. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He says, His divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the epignosis of Him, the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Your knowledge of the Spirit, your knowledge of the Scripture, your knowledge of these realities is what activates them in your life. It says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered into their inheritance. You ready for the glorious life? Yes. Oh, that's what you ought to believe in every day. Every day. Refuse the down life. The life of defeat and poverty. Refuse it. Hallelujah. Yes. Refuse it. He had made us kings and priests. Kings and priests, kings, we decree. He says, and thou shalt decree a thing also, and it shall be established unto thee. He says, where the word of a king is, there is power. So, you speak like a king, you pray like a priest. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Because you have heard the word of God. Life has come to your family. Can you say amen? Yeah. You are a blesser of people. Yeah. That's what God raised you for. He raised you for this hour, for this time, for this generation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You are a child of destiny. Yeah. You were brought to this world for a purpose. And you have started. You are on your way. Can you shout him in somebody? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Oh glory to God. You are in connection with deity. Say amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Siboronde Grosha Bahaya. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Goshke Pronde Lemanda, Gusa Pratulaho. Savra de la Bagiso. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Siboron de Grosha Bahaya. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. When you are faced with situations that challenge your faith in the Word of God, there is one key thing you must do. You must fight. It's not a fight with gloves or F-16s, but it's a good fight of faith. Join Pastor Chris in this enlightening teaching series as he victoriously takes you through the steps on how to fight the good fight. So fight! Unleash your faith! That's all it takes, brother! That's all! You say, I'm a child of God, and I'm going to live the victorious life that Jesus has given to me! Ah. Hey! Ha ha ha! 
pick up your phone and call the numbers displayed on your screen to order for this message. Or you can log on to www.theonlinestore.org to place your order. Three-volume DVD set by Pastor Chris. They include teachings on different topics that would give you insight for living the up life that the Bible has promised every Christian. Many times, a lot of Christians want to understand prayer. They want to know how to pray, to have resources. See, that there are rules for prayer. There are different kinds of prayer, and there are rules for prayer. Yes. You don't need to pray a powerful prayer. All you need to pray is a prayer to a powerful God. What do you say to a Christian who is experiencing demonic oppressions? A Christian who is experiencing oppression needs to exercise his authority. They have to know about the authority to exercise it. When we speak in tongues, we are emboldened, we are empowered. Without speaking in tongues, we cannot grow up spiritually. Can every, can every Christian speak in tongues? Get armed and ready to live victoriously. Order now for this three-volume DVD set today by calling any of the numbers now displayed on your screen or online at www.christembassyonlinestore.org. D, audio and video CD, audio and videotape. So start placing your orders today. So this time, three kinds of wisdom. The reason for failure in life is the lack of wisdom. Why did God deposit all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Jesus? Why? Because of us. God's righteous ones are supposed to have a mindset. The mindset of a victor. The mindset of one who is more than a conqueror. A mindset of a success. This is the kind of wisdom that he wants to take you to. Maybe you haven't gotten it yet. The, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 11, For the value of wisdom is far above rubies. Nothing can be compared to it. Join Pastor Chris in this teaching series as he takes you through three kinds of wisdom that would surely keep you ahead always. Order for your copies today.